It's now down to two in the race for San Diego mayor. Carl DeMaio and Bob Filner will face each other in a November runoff. I'm Dwayne Brown. Tonight on Evening Edition, we've got analysis of the Tuesday primary results. I'm Joanne Farian. They began as adversaries, but now Bob Filner is hoping for an alliance. Congressman Filner reaches out to Nathan Fletcher and his supporters. KPBS Evening Edition starts now. Good evening. The two most ideologically opposed candidates in the San Diego mayor's race face a November runoff. Conservative Republican Carl DeMaio is the top vote getter in yesterday's primary with 32 percent of the vote, while liberal Democrat Bob Filner was just two points behind him. Both candidates say they're looking forward to the runoff. Here's Councilman DeMaio speaking to his supporters last night. Tonight, I am honored that San Diegans have also advanced my candidacy for mayor to the November runoff. San Diego, San, Diego, <laughs> San Diego is emerging from a frustrating decade, what I call our city's lost decade. San Diego is like a car that has been spinning its wheels and stuck in neutral. My friends, San Diegans are ready to move our city forward into the future. Now, I recognize there are some San Diegans for whom I was not their first choice in the primary election. I want to earn your support. In my administration, on this journey, we are leaving no San Diegan behind. Reform in San Diego has no party label. It's a San Diego cause. We know from the results tonight, from the progress we've made, that San Diegans are back in the driver's seat. This car is no longer in neutral. We're in drive, and we're stepping on the gas. We invited Councilman DeMaio to talk with us today, but he was not available. His opponent was, and Joanne Farring is talking with Congressman Bob Filner at the roundtable. He surpassed even the polls' predictions, garnering 30 percent of the vote. Longtime Liberal Congressman Bob Vilner will be in the mayoral runoff this November. He joins me now. Congratulations, Congressman. Thank you. you know, it's kind of humbling to be in a runoff for mayor of the eighth biggest city in the country, a city where I grew up in. So uh, it's kind of humbling to be there. And, and actually, all throughout the night, even with early returns, you were clearly uh, in second place. Um, it really wasn't that close between you and Nathan Fletcher. So what, what were you thinking all the way through? Because that was really the race people were watching for second place. Well, we, we, uh, you know, we uh, did some early polling, and it was almost exactly the way it turned out. Uh, so we knew we had a lot of confidence that we would be in the runoff. Uh, I was still trying to surpass Mr. DeMaio, and, and uh, maybe there's, some, there's, uh, there's 100,000 or something provisional votes, so who knows what will finally be the final thing. But uh, uh, I think people responded to the kind of experience I have in that uh, nobody who's ever run for mayor in San Diego has been as well prepared as me. I mean, I've been even on the school board. Even though you heard board. criticism, even on this show, that, that you weren't prepared. So obviously you're getting the last laugh on this. Yeah, well, look, I've been on the school board and been school board president. I've been twice elected city council and been deputy mayor. Ten times elected to, to Congress, been the chairman of the Veterans Affairs Committee. You don't get into those positions uh, without doing things and without having the confidence of your peers and the electorate. Uh, and I think people respond to that. You know, I can't go anywhere in this city for even a couple blocks without someone coming up to me and saying, you helped, my, uh, you helped me with immigration problem or you helped me with uh, this uh, veterans issue or you gave my child uh, his diploma in high school. So I think that's the secret weapon. When you have served people for three decades, uh, those people uh, remember that. I want to move forward to your strategy now for the general election because uh, if we look at who plays third and fourth, Nathan Fletcher, Bonnie Dumanis, uh, one would argue their positions on major issues in terms of the city of San Diego are closer aligned to Carl DeMaio. How are you going to convince them to vote for you when your position is quite different? You know, uh, Mr. DeMaio never got above a certain ceiling. I mean, he, he was polling at 30 percent approximately 
the whole campaign. That is, he didn't move up or down. So he has a base. Uh, I think the people who voted for uh, Mr. Fletcher, Ms. Uh, Dumanis, uh, are people who are looking for a common sense approach to things. I think I offer that. I, I think we'll get the vast majority of their votes because I'm going to come with a very uh, pragmatic uh, sense of, of what we're going to do for the future of San Diego. And I will tell you personally, uh, and I know it's true with Mr. Fletcher, he and Mr. DeMaio did not get along. And I think uh, his supporters felt that hostility, and I'm not sure they could vote for Mr. DeMaio. So we're looking. Uh, I, I talked to Nathan today. Uh, we're going to get together next week. We'll you see can if, ask for his endorsement? I'm, I'm going to ask for his endorsement, oh. and we're going to see that if we can get the vast majority of his supporters. Uh, but I think people want solutions. They don't want, uh, they don't want ideology. They, I, I, you know, they want to know about jobs. They want to know about the environment. They want to know about livable cities. These are not... Uh, ideological issues. We're out of time, but I want to ask you just quickly. I know that you joke throughout the campaign that Nathan Fletcher could come work for you if you if you become mayor. You're going to ask for his endorsement. Do we see maybe an alliance well, there? Happening? I mean, I hope so. That is, uh, I think he's a he's a was a very good candidate. Obviously, uh, someone who has a real future. Uh, I would like to uh, help him uh, uh, become a more progressive candidate and uh, and and so join our administration. Congressman Filner, <laughs> thanks for being here. Thank you. Our media partner, 10 News, caught up with Assemblyman Nathan Fletcher this morning and asked who he was going to support after coming in third place. Here's what he had to say. You know, I don't know. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go surfing. I'm going to spend some time with my boys and, uh, you know, very committed to, uh, to San Diego and to the great potential we have. Uh, what that looks like moving forward, I don't know. Well, you know, look, I called Congressman Bob Filner and Councilman Carl DeMaio and congratulated them uh, on their victory. I'm a San Diegan first. And... I want the absolute best for our city, uh, and I want our next mayor to be very successful. Fletcher made national headlines by dropping out of the Republican Party during the campaign. He says he has no regrets about his decision. Mayor Jerry Sanders says Fletcher was hurt by not having an established party behind him. By the way, Sanders' own choice for mayor, District Attorney Bonnie Dumanis trailed in fourth place throughout the night, but remained positive as the returns came in. Here's what she had to say. Our message was strong at the end, and so I'm looking forward to seeing the numbers as they come out. But anyway, you, you slice it. Um, I was doing this for San Diego, and uh, I am proud of the support I have. There was a big surprise last night in the race for the 51st Congressional District. Incumbent Senator Denise Ducheney will not advance to the general election. The top Vote-getters were Democrat Juan Vargas and Republican Michael Crimmins. Vargas received nearly 46 percent of the vote, while Crimmins got about 20 percent. Duchenne got just over 15 percent. On to the 52nd Congressional District. It's still a close race to determine who will face Representative Brian Bilbray in November. Port Commissioner Scott Peters holds a very slim lead over fellow Democrat Lori Saldana with 22.6 percent compared to Saldana's 22 percent. Bill Bray received about 41 percent of the vote. Pension reform was one of the big issues on the ballot, but not just in San Diego. Voters in San Jose overwhelmingly approved a pension reform measure by a vote of 70 percent. Joanne and her guests are talking about the plan approved in San Diego. Voters overwhelmingly supported pension reform for city workers, passing Prop B with more than 60 percent of the vote. The measure gets rid of guaranteed pensions for all new city employees, except police officers, and freezes pensionable earnings for all current employees for five years. Or at least that's what the proposition will attempt to do. Joining me to, ex to explain is the head of the city's largest union, Michael Zuckett, and city attorney Jan Goldsmith. Thank you both for being here. Pleasure. Congratulations you. to you, Jan. Jan Goldsmith, you, you, you won, you ran unopposed. Um, now let's talk about this, uh, about Prop B. Bring us up to date, first of all, in terms of the city's official position as to whether or not Prop B, now that it's passed, is even legal. Well, the city's position is that it's, uh, that it's legal and that we have an obligation to implement it. It'll be a, a part of our city charter. Um, how you implement it has to be in a legal manner. And so we have been working on some options, and we'll be discussing that later in the week. But um, we're going to defend it, we're going to implement it, and we're going to implement it in a legal manner. Now, Michael Zuckett, the union's position on this? Uh, well, first of all, that's, that's news to us, that the city has determined that the measure is legal. Up until yesterday, they were saying that 
it wasn't their initiative and they had made no legal determination about anything in the initiative. Apparently something's changed overnight. But uh, what should come next is the city should go through a thoughtful determination about each provision because that's what the initiative and now the voters said to do, which is to examine all these. We want to do these things, but we want to make sure that they're legal first, number one. And number two, to the extent we're going to implement them, we need to implement them in a way that's consistent with the law. And that's not going to be a short process, but it's something that we would hope the city would want to do next. And before we, you know, we don't, we don't want to shoot first and find out later that, that, that something is wrong with it. That legal analysis should happen first, and that's what we would expect to happen in the coming months. Isn't there already some kind of court action or quasi-judicial action going on? Yeah, there's five cases pending uh, in front of the, uh, four of them in front of uh, the Public Employment Relations Board and one already in the Court of Appeal. Um, uh, the basis for that litigation we don't think very much of. Um, but let's take a look. Let's keep our eye on the ball. What the voters said very clearly is that they want pension reform, and they, they want it in this manner, and they want us to implement it. They did not say, we want to pu punish public employees. Uh, I have 320 people in my law office. It's one of the largest law offices in San Diego. We do a lot of work for the city of San Diego. Uh, I don't want to lose good people. I want to attract and retain good lawyers and support staff. Many of my support staff, members of his uh, association, and then our attorneys have their own association, their union. We want to find a way to implement this, implement this legally, which we think we can do. Uh, we want to uh, implement it in a way that allows us to attract and retain good employees and is, is not harmful to our employees. And, you know, frankly, you do that at the bargaining table, and we're willing to be there. If it's litigation, we don't. You know, we, we're going to look at every, and we have, and we're, we're looking at every provision. And, and, and frankly, if we find something that we think is illegal, we're going to be honest about it. But I, at this I, point, I we're, to we can to, enforce it. To, to step in here, when you talk about negotiation, uh, because isn't that a big part of this? I think the voters were told that this was going to save hundreds of millions of dollars, when in fact it only saves that money if there is this five-year freeze of pensionable pay, isn't that still subject to negotiation and approval by council? Yes, the initiative itself, even I think the supporters would agree, doesn't save anything by itself. It requires the city to do something in the future which is subject to negotiation and is, a, and is subjective and may or may not happen. But, but, you know, it's interesting on the legal front, you know, we are in court, we are at the 4th District Court of Appeals next Wednesday. And the city attorney may not think much of that litigation, but the 4th District Court of Appeals does because it's an order to show cause, which is court jargon for we don't so much like the city's position on this one. And so, you know, this has a ways to go in the courts, and I would, uh, I hope, and I take the city attorney certainly at face value that the city also wants to do it right. And we can't cherry pick what the voters said yesterday. The voters said they wanted to pass an initiative that was legal. And we need to make that determination first. Let me, let me just correct something. Um, a court of appeal hearing on an OSC is not a determination on the merits. It's a determination that they're going to hear it. And actually, we agree that they should hear it. Um, and we'll have, as I said, an implementation plan that we've been working on. We're going to, later this week, we're going to have a very specific plan. Um, we really don't want to get it mired in, in litigation. That's not what the voters want. And I don't think that's necessary. I think it's a waste of time and money. Uh, I think we can implement these provisions of Proposition B and still be fair to our employees, and I think that's got to be the goal. But, we, you know, the city does its best work when we're down at the table. Retiree health, for example, we sat down on the table after litigation, and, you know, we had to win some lawsuits. And yeah. We had to win some lawsuits. And it's, and it's too late now, but we couldn't agree more on that, yeah. which is why we, the unions and the city employees, were so, frankly, offended by certain people going to the ballot box when, at the table, including with the city attorney's help, we've done so much in the way of reform to get us to a structurally balanced budget and a leader in the nation in pension reform. Yet now we go to the ballot box, we're mired in the politics of the mayor's race and now litigation, it's all steps backwards. We're out of time, but I just want to briefly get a time frame from both of you and your estimation because I heard uh, Council Member Kevin Faulkner last night say, let's implement Prop B and start saving money. How realistic? What's the time frame? Is it a year, two years, three years down the road where we're actually going to see something there's, from Prop B implemented? There's actually and different we've got time. about 10 seconds. Okay, there's different timelines under Prop B. It doesn't even take effect until mid-July to early August. We'll have a uh, a specific plan later this week in which we'll talk about that. A lot of the implementation does depend upon the litigation and uh, whether we, we sit down at the table, but the city must 
take steps to, to begin to implement it, and we will. And I'm going to let you close, Michael. Our next steps depend on the city's next steps and their determinations about what they think is legal and what they want to implement and how. But at the end of the day, the most likely outcome is that a court's going to determine what's legal and not here, and that is anybody's guess as to how long that might take. Thank you both for being here. Thank you. Thank you. Now, last night at Golden Hall, we did talk to San Diego Mayor Jerry Sanders about the possibility of a lawsuit. Well, you know, everybody's talking about lawsuits. That's up to judges to decide, but uh, judges listen to what voters say also, and I think we have written it in such a way that it will withstand challenges. Proposition B was staunchly opposed by union leaders, and so was Proposition A regarding project labor agreements. Prop A bars the city from requiring those agreements on construction contracts. Those agreements were regarded as union-friendly. Just over 58 percent of voters approved the measure. The vote on a new tobacco tax is still too close to call tonight. The no votes on Proposition 29 hold a narrow lead, but there are still votes to be counted, so the tally isn't final. Prop 29 would establish a new dollar-a-pack sales tax on cigarettes, with the revenues going to help fund cancer research. The results are clear-cut on the other statewide ballot measure. California voters approved Proposition 28 with a yes vote of 61 percent. It sets new term limits for the state legislature. Lawmakers would only be able to serve 12 years total. Current law allows for up to 14 years. The new law applies to future lawmakers and not those already in office. Turning now to the contested seats on the San Diego City Council, voters in District 1 will go back to the polls in November. Incumbent Sherry Leitner received about 42 percent of the vote, while philanthropist Ray Ellis got just under 46 percent, not enough to win outright, but enough to force a runoff. As someone who came here 25 years ago and started a small business with only four employees and grew that to several hundred employees, I know about job growth and I know what small businesses need to thrive. And I want to bring those experiences to bear so we can create an environment here where we get people back to work, we allow companies to grow and stay here in San Diego, and that benefits all of us across the city. No runoff needed in the 7th District Council race. Scott Sherman received the 51 percent needed to win. It is the first political office for Sherman who says it's a sign voters want reform at City Hall. And we can see from the numbers with Prop A and Prop B that reform is really what's resonating with the voters out there tonight, and we're quietly optimistic that we'll keep going with the way we are and get this thing reformed and get city council back in the way it should be and get the nation back to where it's understanding that unsustainable pension benefits and government employee unions are ruining the quality of life we have here. And the newly created 9th Council District will be represented by a familiar face. Marty Emerald claimed victory early on election night, getting 72 percent of the vote over opponent Mateo Camarillo. It was one of the widest margins of victory in the primary election. For the first time in nearly two decades, there is an open seat in the San Diego County Board of Supervisors after District 3 Supervisor Pat, uh, rather Pam Slater-Price chose not to run for re-election. Her choice for a successor, Dave Roberts, is headed for a runoff in November. Roberts got about 31 percent of the vote, right behind Steve Dannon, who got almost 33 percent. Our cameras caught up to Roberts at Golden Hall last night. What I want to do is, is really focus on the core services in the county. I want to focus on children and women's services. I want to focus on environmental services. There's just so many things that the people have told me they're passionate about. But there are so many things that we can really do better. The day after an election is when the pundits and political scientists look at what went right and what went wrong with different campaigns. Joanne's got some analysis with her guests at the roundtable. Joining me to talk about the big primary election picture is political scientist Carl Luna. Carl, thanks for coming back to the show. Nice to be here. So let's talk about turnout. First of all, primaries are known to have low voter turnout. Was that the case last night? Well, for a while it looked like how low can you go because the voter turnout now is officially 28 percent, but when the absentees come in, registrar's voters are saying it might be up in the high 30s, which is bad, just not abysmal. In terms of also big picture, we hear a lot about whether or not San Diego is turning Democrat, traditionally Republican. If you look at who won, who's winning, who's going to the runoff, how did we vote? 
We are GOP in the spring, and we're a bit more Democratic in the fall, because in the fall electorate, you get a bigger turnout, and there are going to be more moderate independents and Democrats who turn out to vote. Now, in the, the election yesterday, you had more liberal Democrats turning out than, and more uh, conservative Republicans than moderates in general. And that's typical of a primary, isn't it? Yeah, it, the primaries, the people who really care show up. Everybody else is playing their Fourth of July getaway. You were on the show a few months ago when we talked about the open primary, top two primary, and that was supposed to be designed to get more moderates out. Did that happen? Yeah, yeah that, that was the theory. <laughs> uh, every time we play around the primary, the hope is you'll get more moderates to turn out and more independents to turn out. Right. One mistake is to assume they're the same thing. Most independents actually have a partisan preference. They just don't like to put the little tag behind their name. And the people who really care are going to show up. Moderates don't show up until November. So it didn't have the impact people had hoped. Okay, race for San Diego mayor. Now, no real surprises, right? I mean, this is what the polls were saying. It would be uh, Filner and Carl DeMaio. Yeah, the only surprise is that there was no surprise. Bob Filner was being attacked by pundits for not having run a big campaign. And if he had come in third, everybody would go, aha, we were right. But now he's brilliant for what he did. He did more <laughs> of a shark attack, coming in low, not spending a lot of money on the campaign, letting uh, Nathan Fletcher get destroyed from all sides. And now he slid into second place, and he's got his ammunition for the fall. Carl DeMaio was always supposed to come in first. His problem is he now has to figure out how to move himself up in terms of the 2012 fall campaign. So both of them are going to want Nathan Fletcher's votes and Bonnie Dumanis' votes. And I'll tell you what Congressman Filner told me just moments ago is that he is going to ask Nathan Fletcher for his endorsement. Is this a brilliant move? And would Nathan Fletcher even give him his endorsement? It's a brilliant move unless you get turned down. So I, ideally, he, he'll work that out before he makes a big public brouhaha about that. I don't know if I was Nathan Fletcher if I'd want to do that because he made his, his reputation now as being an independent. You switch from Republican to independent to Democrat, you get a little wishy-washy in there. But it would certainly help Bob Filner if he got Nathan Fletcher's endorsement. And do people pay attention to those endorsements? Not a whole lot, but enough of them will that it's going to, every little thing you do, money you spend, doors you knock on, these are certain amounts of votes in your till, and if you can pick up votes, you never walk away from them. If you look at just policy, uh, when you compare Carl DeMaio, Nathan Fletcher, and Bonnie Dumanis, they're very similar, uh, and, and Bob Filner is very different, so I would make the assumption that those votes would go to Carl DeMaio if people are voting based on policy. People don't just vote based on policy, though. They vote on identity. There's a number of voters who voted for Bonnie Dumanis who are not going to vote for Carl DeMaio in the fall, and they'll either stay home or go to Bob Vilner. Uh, when Nathan Fletcher became an independent, he gained 10, 12 points in the polls. Those did not come from a Republican base. So those votes may very well go to Bob Vilner. Uh, if I was Carl DeMaio, I would take solace in the fact I came in first, but I would look at it and say, look, I only got 31 percent. I've got a lot of ground to cover between now and November. Let's move on to some of the other big stories last night. Now, the 52nd Congressional District. What happened there? Uh, Brian Bilbray came in first, but this is another case of came in first in the primary, going to have a harder time closing the deal in the general election because his district now is much more moderate than it, the district he used to run in. And this would be the second time if he lost in November he had a district shot out from under him because of redistricting. So he's got to position himself as a moderate Republican, but still hope to attract a lot of national money to help him be able to win the election. Uh, it's still not quite certain Scott Peters, Lori Saldana, probably Scott Peters, but the Democrats collectively got 4% more of the vote than Brian Bilbrey did, and this will put them in a better situation for the November election. An interesting district, still slightly more Republicans than Democrats, and then a lot of De decline to states. Yeah, it kind of breaks by thirds. Now, the question with those decline to states, how are they going to break in terms of Republican and Democrat and the voter turnout come November? There's going to be a tidal wave of national money that rolls in for this race. Any surprises last night in any of these races? Uh, surprises where there weren't many surprises. I think the most interesting on the little sideline was the 51st that Senator Denise DeCheney failed to come in first or second for that race. Juan Vargas came in first with a clear uh, advantage in the voting. And then he has a Republican opponent who probably doesn't have much chance come the fall. We don't hear a lot about state assembly and state senate races. Basically, th these are going to be decided in the November election. Was that pretty standard in terms of the top two? Yeah, the Republican and Democratic candidates you expected to win one where there's a comp competitive seat. In most of the seats, it's going to be a Republican or Democrat. They'll win their primary, and that'll be it come November. So you'll look at a couple of races possibly in the fall for the state legislature that might be interesting. We haven't got a lot of time, but
but I know a, a number of San Diego Council races were actually determined, either people running unopposed. Well, what's the makeup going to look like now of this new city council? We had a, a 5 3 Democratic majority council. We've added the 9th district, which is a Democratic pickup, but Republicans have picked up the 7th district with Mr. Sherman. So the best either party can do will be a 5 4 uh, majority come the fall, and it will be a 5 4 one way or another. Nobody gets a veto proof majority, which will be interesting depending on which mayor we have. That we can even say we got a debate about Republican, Democrat, mayor, and city council is a sign San Diego is changing. Carl Luna, thanks for being here. I want to send people to kpbs.org because I know you spoke with Maureen Kavanaugh earlier uh, at length. So if they want to hear more about this, then go to kpbs.org. Thank you Thank so you much. Thank you very much. As we mentioned earlier, there are still a couple of races too close to call. We're waiting to hear who will face Congressman Brian Bilbray in the 52nd Congressional District and for a final count on California's Proposition 29. We are keeping the numbers updated on our website kpbs.org slash election. We've also got all of today's interviews online for you. Thanks for joining us. You have a great night.